praise his holy name. I, uh, I would like to this morning for a few minutes and staying in our tradition lift up to you a passage two passages one is found in the Old Testament in the book of First Kings First Kings chapter 10 And the other is found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12 of the Gospel of Matthew, 1 Kings, chapter 10, and Matthew, chapter 12. And you will find these similar words there. First Kings chapter 10, starting in verse 1, you will find these. Five words. I like to live. When the queen of Sheba, look at chapter 12, Matthew, yeah, I knew that blew your mind. I had to let that settle in. Never did that before. <laughs> Got to mix it up for you. Verse 38. Reading from the New Living Translation. One day some teachers of religious law and the Pharisees came to Jesus and said, Teacher, we want you to show us a miraculous sign to prove your authority. Verse 39, but Jesus replied, only an evil, adulterous generation would demand a miraculous sign, but the only sign I will give them is the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah who in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Then the people of Nineveh will stand up against this generation on judgment day and condemn it. For they repented of their sins at the preaching of Jonah. Now, someone greater than Jonah is here, but you refuse to repent. The queen of Sheba will also stand up against this generation of judgment on judgment day and condemn it, for she came from a distant land to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Now, someone greater than Solomon is here, but you refuse to listen. You may be seated in the presence of our God. I want to talk about, for a few minutes, the Queen of Sheba. History has let us know and scholars have made clear for us that this queen of Sheba that pops up in the life of Solomon was a queen that came from Ethiopia. 
some have tried to fit her in Iraq or Iran, but scholars have discovered that it's more true to place her in Ethiopia. You know, just as well as I know, that the place of Ethiopia is in the continent of Africa. We also have come to know where she came from by that great historian Josephus. He said that she came from Ethiopia. It's important that that's pointed out because there seems to be a subtle undermining of those that have been burned by the morning sun having any place in the scripture. But this queen, she came from Ethiopia. Without being technical and without digging deeper into the biblical blueprint, I want to just deal with four things this morning about this queen from Ethiopia. I'm going to look at what was the cause of her coming. And then I want to further probe to this text of the curiosity for her coming. And then I want us to observe the cost of her coming. And then I want to conclude with the commendation and the condemnation of her coming. Three simple points that I hope will be as profound as it was for me in concentrating on the queen of Sheba. Uh, this, you know, bear with me for a minute. This uh, thing here is a little heavy on my back. It really is. It's really heavy. I ain't trying to say it off. I just want to have some movement when I um, share with you this morning. You must picture this. And the text hints about it that this woman and a caravan I don't mean a small caravan. I mean from a distance. It was she and the caravan would look like a row of ants that you see around your home or your house and they're in a line and they are moving in a direction. It appeared that way from afar when Solomon looked out his window across the desert and saw this crowd of people, a caravan of people with the sand rising from the desert as they approached uh, Jerusalem for the king of Judah. Solomon, here they, he saw them, saw her from afar. And with this distance of traveling over 1,200 miles to get to this king called Solomon, 
why would someone travel that long of distance with a caravan of precious gold and precious stones and precious wood and precious ointments as the text shares with us in chapter 10 of first kings with the sister chapter in second chronicles chapter 9 you will find that this woman traveled all that long distance because the queen of Sheba had heard of Solomon's fame, which brought honor to the name of the Lord. The reason why, my sisters and my brothers, that she traveled so long and so far through the heat and probably different changes of weather and having thousands of people with her, not only guards, but beauticians and uh, carpentry persons and those that were craftsmen and with camels and oxen and a few horses. They traveled that long because she heard that whatever Solomon had done, his reputation was connected to the Lord. Everything that she heard about him, it may have been said to her about the great temple he had built that his father David had uh, designed. It may have been about the great castle that he had built a home for himself and it may have been about his reputation of being a wise king but the text says the cause for her really coming is because of what he did he did in honor to the Lord uh, can I just throw this out as a point maybe a principle for our lives this morning what are you known for and what do people adjacent it to do they just adjacent it to your intellectual capacity because you are so brilliant do they adjacent it to just how you are very fugal in your finances and you're successful financially? Do they adjacent it to your oratorical skills and they just want to hear what you have to say? You are a crowd dazzler because of what comes out of your mouth, I would suggest to any and every believer here this morning, they ought to tack behind whatever it is that they are coming to hear or coming to consult with you, is that this individual has done task that is a tribute to the Lord. It's based on what he has done through us, what he is doing in us. I would think it would be a sad thing to be known as Buffett might be known for his billions of dollars in his enterprise of finances, and that's it. I, I want to talk to Warren Buffett because he has all of these resources and have built a financial institution and he is now known as a billionaire. But I want to say to you, what profits a man if he or she would gain the whole world but yet lose their own soul?
The grass will wither and the flower will fade and the moth will eat up what we have on this side of heaven. But who can save the soul? What profit if I gain everything that the world has to offer me? Fame, finances, fashion, all of those things. And I look good and I wear good and I drive good and I smell good and I've got good money. But at the end of the day you can put at the end of that life this life will self-destruct because of the mere fact that is not done per se in honor of the Lord a matter of fact whatever we do should be because of or we should be connected to the name and the honor of the Lord. It should be inseparable that I am what I am by the grace of God. I have what I have because God has been favorable toward me. I do what I do because I've been gifted and anointed by God to do what I do. She came because she heard of his reputation and his reputation was adjacent to the Lord. It was what he did in honor of the Lord. Let me hasten, lest I put you to sleep. The queen of Sheba, she not only has a cause for coming to hear Solomon or to see Solomon, but she had curiosity in her coming. It's in verse number two where the text says in verse number one, the B section of verse number one, the Bible said that she came, <laughs> excuse me, <clears throat> to test him with hard questions. When she arrived in Jerusalem with a large group of attendants and a great caravan of camel and the camel were loaded with spices and large quantities of gold and precious jewel. When she met with Solomon, she talked with him about everything she had on her mind. Lord have mercy. The Bible says that she came not only because of the cause of his reputation, but she also came because of her curiosity. And she came to do what this verse says, to test him. That word in the Hebrew, test or prove, it has to do with the quality of someone or the something through a demonstration of stress. Meaning that she came to put stress on what she heard because she wanted to make sure the reputation was just as real as the person. Oh, my sisters and my brothers, how should we and why should we even trust what someone just says about us? What is it that they are saying? And when they come and the minute they push just a little, we shatter and we break. We fall short of our reputation. No, she came because she wanted to know if Solomon was, was who, he, who they say he was. And I need for you to know we might do good to do that with people that have influence in our lives. We might do good to try and test to see if 
people are able to stand up under the stress to validate their reputation to stress give stress to to validate the reputation that's out there about us we might need to do that with politicians and with people that have businesses and finances and those that may be in construction you just don't want to go off of what the reputation is you want to see if they have a repertoire of proof of who they are you're looking at me strange uh, I think you're looking at me strange because some of us have been got have gotten by with just what people say about us but when they come and they come to test the quality of our person by demonstrating stress to see how we respond in circumstances and situations, that will help them to know who they need to vote for and who they need to pray for and who they need to follow or who they may not need to follow. What is your rep? And not only that, is your rep real? Is it backed up with quality? Is it backed up with knowing more than what people say about us? Do we demonstrate it when we find ourselves in tight, stressful situations. Oh, there's a many of us that can quote and tote that can say what he said. But when it comes to demonstrating, we will find ourselves, some of us, falling short of what we know in our head than what we believe in our heart. My sisters and my brothers, please don't get duped by just falling for what people say. We must go further and be curious to see if they are what they say we are. Don't get mad when somebody pushes the envelope a little bit, when somebody pauses stress to be upon us a little bit. Don't get upset about that because if you get upset and if I get upset about that, we are saying to individuals that who do you think you are to do what you do to qualify who I am when you have heard about who I am? Uh, what they heard may not be validated by what you do or who you really are. Uh, you know, a lot of us have built a great reputation by a great somewhat presentation. But when it is pushed with stress, will it break and fold or will it stand? Lord have mercy. So much I want to say about that, but because of the brevity of time, I'm going to move on to about this queen of Sheba. Not only does she show us the cause of us coming, not only does she show us the curiosity that made her come, but also when you read this passage of scripture along with Second Chronicles chapter 9, you also see something else here, and that is the cost of her coming. Uh, if you would, read with me so that you won't believe I'm making this up. The Bible says that when the queen of Sheba in verse 4 realized how very wise Solomon was and when she saw the palace that he had built, she was overwhelmed. She was also amazed at the food that was on his table 
the organization of his officials and the splendid clothing of the cupbearers. Look at that. She was looking at not only food, but she was looking at fashions. She, here you go, Minister Reed. She came and checked out their haberdashery. He, he, the Bible says that he looked at the splendid clothing made that was for the cupbearers. And she looked at the burnt offering Solomon made at the temple of the Lord. She exclaimed. Everything I heard in my country about your achievements and wisdom is true. I didn't believe what was said until I arrived here and saw it with my own eyes. In fact, I had not heard the half of it. Your wisdom and prosperity are far beyond what I was told. How happy your people are and must be. What a privilege for your officials to stand here day after day listening to your wisdom. Then she breaks out in a praise. Praise the Lord your God who delights in you and has placed you on the throne of Israel because the Lord's eternal love for Israel he has made for king, I mean made you king so you can rule with justice and righteousness. Watch this. Verse 10. Here it is. The cost that she came, that she bought for coming. She says, then she gave the king a great gift of 9,000 pounds of gold, great quantities of spices and precious jewels. Never again were so many spices bought as those the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. I'm going to stop and lock and load right here for a minute. Notice my sisters and my brothers, she understood that it would be and it was going to be an investment. She invested in her trip and she invested to hear Solomon's truth. All that she bought with her was an investment. And she demonstrated her appreciation for what Solomon had revealed to her in answering hard questions and all of the matters that were upon her heart. Can you imagine that? That everything that you had been pondering through the years, she was no little child, she was an adult woman. All these thoughts she had pondered in her heart and in her mind, she spoke it out to Solomon. And Solomon gave her a lucid answer to every one of her issues that she pondered in her heart. Oh, my sisters and brothers, and when I read this text, I look at her example of understanding the cost of what it was and the cost of what she gave because of the truth and what she received that answered questions for her life and impacted her life throughout her lifetime. It was no tidbits that she got at that moment and said, that's good for now. No, when she left, she took all of that truth, all of that wisdom, and, in, and it impacted her life on a day-to-day -day basis. She invested in her trip, and she also invested for Solomon's truth. We have to be ready, my sisters and my brothers, to pay for the product. 
many times in our lives that you and I will try to cheapen the quality of a product so that we can fit it in our lives. Otherwise, a lot of us seek to get Mercedes-Benz Cadillac, well, that used to be a brand that was known as um, BMW, Audi, Lexus, Amenities, but we want to pay Ford prices. My sisters and my brothers, if we don't do that with carnal commodities, how dare we should do that with truth and God and his purposes and what he stands behind. We do it all the time, even with God. We want the abundance of blessings, but we want the minimum of commitment. So God, give me this. Do this for me. Run over here. Touch this. Handle this. Please, in the name of Jesus, fix this. Please give me this. Let me be a recipient of this, but yet we don't put a cost, a price on what God has done for us. We want to show what we think about it by giving him nickel and dimes kind of uh, presentation when he has made us a recipient of exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can act or so even dream of. He is the one that is able to keep us from stumbling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. He's the only wise God, our Savior, and when it comes to him asking us to give to him, we give him. Oh, I know you might get mad at me this morning. You might even tip me in my offering. But I can't hide the fact or deny the fact that when it comes to those things that are connected and tied to God, we cheapen it. I take it quietness is contemplation. We do, and I'm going to say this to some of you preachers that are here. You want to be what God wants you to be, but you won't even invest into your education to hone your gift. No, it's not going to give you the gift, but it'll help you hone the gift. You won't go to a conference on your own because you want somebody else to support that endeavor. And then I will go, but you will take a cruise <laughs> to St. Croix. You go somewhere in one of those islands out there and you have no problem paying for that. But you have a problem paying for that which will enrich you and make you on a longer term basis and what God has called you to be. We cheapen the gift that is full of so much value that we will not give. Oh, I think our priorities are wrong. But his, hers was right. And this is the other thing, and I'm closing and I'm coming to a close. And this is the other thing. The other thing is that she did not seem to give it out of obligation. 
she gave it out of appreciation for what she had received. Let me ask you this. How can you put a price tag on that which can revolutionize and has revolutionized your life? No, 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 no. I'm not talking about going to a club event that the result of it is you have a good time being there, but after the benediction, you cannot use any of those things to affect the rest of your life. Okay. It, it's temporary. Lord have mercy. But when one invests like she did in the truth that she received from Solomon, Lord have mercy. She was saying that what I'm giving you is really less than what you've given me because I am going to be changed for the rest of my life. And you can't tell me that Solomon did not tell her and she, uh, she testified to the fact that Solomon did not tell her about the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God of his father, David. You can't tell me that he did not tell her the wisdom that I have is not because I have it naturally or normally. It's not a part of my DNA. I asked for it. Because you remember when Solomon was asked of the Lord, what is it that you want? He said, Lord, I don't want anything but wisdom so that I might be able to guide, direct, lead your people. And God says, because I, you have not asked for your enemies. You have not asked for this. You have not asked for that. But because you've asked for this, I'm going to give you this, that, this, that, and some more. I think she teaches us what do we value? What is it that we value? I'm going to move on. That was too, too hard and heavy. Um, but, but, but that's what he did. That's what she did. It was not out of obligation. It was out of appreciation. And you and I need to do the same. We don't give to God out of obligation. Well, if you are, you're not giving properly. You ought to, I ought to, we ought to give to God out of appreciation. Appreciation for what? You here this morning, aren't you? Appreciation for what? He took care of you yesterday. <laughs> Last week, last month, last year, and he keeps doing it over and over and over again. Put that aside. What do you think it cost God to save my and your raggedy soul and to fix and change our raggedy lives? He did not penny pinch when he gave unto us. He gave us the best thing that he had. It was a value. The Bible said that Christ was rich. That through his poverty we might be made rich. I'm telling you it's the best thing that he could have ever given unto us. For God so loved the world that he gave us his only one of a kind of son that whosoever and I got a whole, whole lot of whosoever's in here that believed in him we are not perishing but we'll have everlasting life he's come that we might have life I'm telling you he ain't cheap that we might have it more abundantly he's that kind of God and we ought to be that kind of people like the queen of Sheba
I, I, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. But let's let's look at the accommodation and the condemnation of her coming. Centuries has passed now. Time has rolled on. And now the Lord Jesus comes on the scene. And he uses her as an ocular demonstration of a commendation and also condemnation. For the text says in chapter 12 of the book of Matthew that these teachers and these scholars, these religious leaders, they were asking him some questions and they asked him to validate himself by showing them a miraculous sign to prove to them his authority. Oh my God. Don't look at them strange. We got people right here, right now, that are in this sanctuary and viewing us on television. I mean, on the, you know, in his internet. Uh, it's, te it's television. Uh, <laughs> and, and viewing us on television. You, 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 we got people j just like that now. Lord, show me something to validate to me as grandma would say, who you is. Show me. Matter of fact, I'm not going to believe until you show me something that will validate that you are who you say you are. I was looking on YouTube and they had this clip of this atheist that was denying God and saying blasphemous things about God and mocking God. And in the middle of her proclamation and propaganda, something happened to her. And everybody got hush, somewhat like you, uh, got quiet. And I'm just simply saying that my sisters and my brothers, he does not have to validate his authority to you and to me because he already did it at the cross. It was at the cross where we first saw the light and the burdens of our lives rolled away. It was there at the cross. I received my sight and now I am happy. I, oh Lord have mercy all the day but here it is. This accommodation and condemnation came from these religious leaders, teachers and religious law teachers and they said to him show us a sign to prove your authority. Jesus clapped back and he said to them, not only an evil and an adulterous generation, watch this, would demand a miraculous sign. But the only sign you going to get, the next signs you going to get will be the one like the prophet Jonah. He was swallowed up in the belly of a great fish. And he was down there for three days and three nights. But he was spewed out of the belly of the fish. Jesus said to them, that's the next sign you're going to get. And there are other people that will help you validate who I am, since y'all are religious teachers of the religious law, 
so they were acquainted with the scripture. Look what Christ does. He gives them the scripture. He says the next sign you're going to get is Jonah. And the sad part about that sign is that when Jonah was spewed out and he went to preach to Nineveh, they repented based on what Jonah had said. You hear me, he says, and there's one here greater than Jonah, and you won't repent on what I'm telling you or uh, you ought to repent on. He also says that those people in Nineveh, they will stand up against this generation on judgment day and condemn it for they repented for their sins at the preaching of Jonah. Now someone here is greater than Jonah but you refuse to repent. He said I'm going to give you another sign since you are acquainted with the scripture. You remember that black that queen from Queen Sheba, from Sheba. You remember what she did. You remember the experience on what the scripture says. She says that she going to stand up also against this generation in the judgment day and condemn it. For she came from a distance. A distant land to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Now someone greater than Solomon is here, but you refuse to listen. Listen, the queen of Sheba, listen to what Solomon said. This is an illustration from the lesser to the greater. Solomon dropped some truth on girlfriend and girlfriend took that truth and it affected her lives and she took it back to Ethiopia and it affected the Ethiopian people in whom she was queen over. And if Solomon can tell her something that was truthful and that was from me because I gave Solomon and wisdom, how much more you have somebody greater than Solomon, somebody that is the wisdom of God, somebody that gave Solomon wisdom to write the book of Proverbs, to write Ecclesiastes. You have somebody greater than Solomon who built the temple for my glory, but now I'll make you a temple for my presence. You got got somebody greater than Solomon. Solomon did not die for the queen of Sheba, but I sure enough is going to die for you because like Jonah, I'm going to be buried in the belly of the earth for three days, but on that third day, I'm going to rise from the grave with all power in my hand. I just stopped by to tell you that we need to follow the example of Queen Sheba. We need to take what she did and apply what she did and I promise you we'll get what she got. So I praise God this morning and I pray that no one under the sound of my voice via virtual or here in live in HD. I want to say this to you. I pray that you do not take these words in vain. I pray that you do not hear these words in vain. I pray that these words don't fall on deaf ears. I pray that your heart is sensitive and not be like the soil when the sower went out to seed and some fell on hard ground and some fell on rocky ground and some fell on shallow ground. I got news for you. God's word wants to fall on good ground. So take the weeds out of your life so that you can receive more seeds in your life. Take the rocks that stop you from growing down and just make you grow up. Get them out of the way. Put aside every sin, every weight that easily besets you. Set your eyes on Jesus. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Somebody greater than Solomon has come. Somebody greater than Solomon has spoken. He's the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star, first and last.